one. Hey guys, Daniel here. This is another video, and in this video, I'm joined by uh, the one, the only John McRae. Uh, for those of you who don't know, John McRae is a comic artist, and he's worked on some amazing comics. Um, he's worked on Hitman, Section 8, The Boys, uh, Judge Dredd, 2000 AD, and also he's worked for Marvel for things like Wolverine, The Hulk, and so much more. Uh, but John has agreed to come on for an interview, so me and him will just be talking about you know, anything you can think of for the next hour. Um, but John, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Daniel. All things considered, uh, yeah. I have currently got three kids at home permanently at the moment. Um, my daughter's school is closed completely. My eldest is in lockdown and isolation in his bedroom. And uh, my other one is off as well. So uh, it's a close um, and trying to get work done is perhaps <laughs> tricky, but you know, it's, um, it's fine. It's fine. We're all healthy at any rate, you know, and, and, and I'm doing fine. So yeah, thank you. Yourself? And it can only get better with Christmas, staying inside with your whole family. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Christmas. You'd want to be no, careful no, about no what you're going to say there. in case they're listening. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, so my yeah, first yeah, question yeah, is, yeah. Um, how'd you get into comics? Ah, right, the million dollar. Um, well, uh, I was always drawing from when I was a wee lad and my mum and dad thought that they, they picked me up a comic because they thought it might encourage my drawing. Um, little did they know, uh, it was Avengers number eight, I believe, and I, and I was four years old or something like that. And they bought, brought this home from the corner shop and I looked at the pictures. I don't think I read it, but I looked at the pictures and said, that's what I'm going to do when I grew up. And that was it. I was locked on to drawing comics. I was became a huge comic fan, mainly a Marvel guy, basically because you could, you know, at that time in the 1970s, you could get British Marvel reprints. You know, the Avengers number eight I got was the British Avengers number eight. Um, and so it was the Spider-Man, Mighty World of Marvel, and, and the Avengers that I was picking up. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to draw comics. Uh, I lived in Belfast, and of course, my mom and dad just thought, well, that's a ridiculous pipe dream. How do you, would you ever do that? And, and I don't think they, they kind of regretted it for the next 20 years or so. Uh, because they couldn't understand, you know, Belfast, the Troubles, Northern Ireland, right. comics are drawn in America, maybe a few in the UK, but mainly the stuff I was interested in was done in America. So how the hell could somebody like me end up being a comic artist? Um, and anyway, how do you make money drawing comics? You know, don't yeah. you just press a button and a comic comes out or something? You know, the people, the civilians don't understand how comics work. Um, so it was a bit of a struggle. I was not interested in school at all. And all I did was draw and read comics and drive my mum and dad around bands. They, I, I left school with a terrible degree and nothing much else. Um, and I decided I'd better get serious about drawing comics. Uh, so I just started submitting my work. I would, I would, I decided that if I was to be a professional artist, I would have to draw, draw about 20 odd pages a month. That's the way professionals work. That's how many pages of a comic. So I figured if I was to draw a monthly comic, I would need to do that. So I basically set tasked myself to draw four or five pages of sample artwork each week. Um, so week one, I would draw a Spider-Man. And then I would photocopy those pages and send, post them off to America, post them off to Brit American Marvel. Um, and then the next week I would draw Batman and send it to whoever the Batman editor was. You know, you would look in the inside of the comic and then DC yeah. and, and see who the editor was and just post it off to them. Though a lot of comic companies had actual in-house uh, new talent people who specifically looked at new artwork that was being sent to them and responded to people, not these days, but you know, that used to be the way. Um, and then uh, my third week, I would draw Judge Dredd or something and send that to 2000 AD. And my fourth week, I would pick one of the many independent comics, because this was now by the 19, 
this was the late 80s, I suppose, like, was it mid 80s? So there was a big black and white explosion in comics back then with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Cerebus and Concrete and all those sorts of comics coming out. Uh, the Maze Agency, Mage. And so I would do samples for Eclipse or whomever and send those off. And then I would repeat the process. And I would start with Spider-Man again or, you know, or the Hulk or what have you, or the Avengers and send them off. And I did that every week for four years. Um, yep, without yeah. fail. I have got sample pages that deep. I was very determined. Um, in the meantime, I was working in a builder's yard to earn money. Um, and and I, I earned some money and then I would use the money to uh, travel over to uh, London and go to British Marvel and 2000 AD and take my portfolio to them and show them my portfolio work. Uh, and at the same time, I started running Belfast's, and North, well, Ireland's first comic shop. I think it was Ireland's first comic shop, Dark Horizons, which was situated just at the back of Good Vibrations, which was uh, Belfast's punk shop at the time. There's a movie called Good Vibrations, and that is the movie is based on the, the record shop. Uh, it was run by Terry Hooley, and I knew Terry well because I bought my punk records off him, me and my mate Fred bought my punk records off him. And then Terry suggested that we run our comic shop out the back of Dark Horizon, back out of the back of Good Vibrations because he has a spare room. And he wasn't going to charge us any rent. So we opened the comic shop at the back of uh, Good Vibes. And that's where I met Garth Ennis, who came in to buy his copies of Concrete and Cerebus Office. That's what he bought, um, plus war comics. Um, <laughs> yes. Doc Horror. And I guess he bought 2000, but he didn't buy that off us. I don't think, I think he got that from his local news agent. Um, so, uh, and of course, everybody who came into my shop knew that I was starting to make headway into comics, uh, you know, as an artist. I think I had picked up by going to uh, British Marvel and to 2000 AD and showing my work personally to Steve McManus at 2000 and to Richard Starkings and, and other guys at, uh, at Marvel. I, I'd started to get little bits of work. I got a future shock um, with 2000 with Hilary Robinson, who's a Northern Irish writer who I knew through a friends as well. She wrote my first future shock and I got, and then on the back of that future shock, I went to British Marvel and said, I've got a future shock in 2008. And they went, Oh, right. Okay. Uh, have a snake. Uh, no, Storm Shadow. They gave me Storm Shadow to draw a five page Storm Shadow story, which went down fine. And then I got a Snake Eyes story from them. Um, and then while this was all going on, Garth had pitched the idea of Troubled Souls to Fleetway. Yes. And the next thing we knew, we were being flown over to, um, to, do, uh, to pitch that to them properly. Um, and that was that. That was it. From there on, it was business as is now. So, yeah, yeah that's how I broke into comics. There and were then, I did other bits and pieces here and there, but that was that's it in a nutshell. And if you want to read in more detail about it, this is me being a terrible salesman. <laughs> no, Buy The Mighty World of McRae, my new book, uh, which you can pick up off my website, off my shop through my website. And that has an article on uh, uh, Troubled Souls and Good Vibes. So, so link in the I mean, description for that. Pardon? Link in the link in the description if you want to go to John's website. It'll be top link in the description. So you uh, just click on that. Um, yeah. But my next question is like, growing up in Northern Ireland, would you say that kind of gave you an advantage into getting into comics, or if anything, you know, it didn't really help you get into comics? Like, if you grew up in England or America, would you say you would have had a better chance of actually getting into comics earlier? I believe so, and it would have been a completely different world you know uh, being in northern ireland there there wasn't much of a comic scene you know there were no comic shops i would go over to the uk go to london and go to comic showcase and go to forbidden planet um and it was just mind blown the first time i went into fp which was on um oh i was going to say dean street but that's where showcase was fp used to be in Oh, forgotten the name of the road that FP was on. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We got the first time I went in there. I think you know, for me, 
going into news agents and picking up a couple of American comics and a few British and then walking into it and that was it that was all you had and then walk into a comic shop a real comic shop in London and seeing wall-to-wall -wall comics everything was just incredible and so there was no real scene in Belfast um, that I knew of uh, I, I met people through like Davy Francis who used to work for Oink I met him and uh, I who was a of a punk comic artist guy they put out a zine called Zimok which was comics backwards and they it, and it was sort of distributed very generally in Belfast in news agents and I had seen it a few times and then I got to know them through a friend when I went to art college for a very few minutes that I went to art college I met a guy called Adrian Lutton who did a short Rogue Trooper story in one of the 2000 AD specials and Adrian now works at the big um, we is what's it called the we three or the we two in Belfast you too uh, is it uh, yeah the we two he's the sort of art director in at we two and through them I met those guys and then Will Simpson of course through yes. uh, those guys I met Will and so my sort of that and that was the network Will was Northern Ireland's first proper comic artist and so I met him through those guys uh, before I think that was just before my shop opened Though I'm not a hun yeah it was before I, my shop opened I met them and sort of started making a network with them but to actually break into comics being in Belfast was tricky I mean yeah. you had you had the big chunk of water between you and getting to a, like a publisher so you know I, I used to when I was going over to show my samples I would my mum or dad would drive me to uh, the ferry and I would get on the Lawrence R ferry with my big portfolio under my arm and take the three R. And back then, the Lawrence and R ferry was horrible. It's not like it is now, which is all posh and beautiful and fancy as hell. And you could sort of make a bed there and you would, you would like to live in the Lawrence and R ferry now. Lawrence and R ferry then was, it was terrible. It was an awful thing. And so you get in the Lawrence and R ferry, get off the other side, get on a, a bus. And I took a bus, a 10 hour bus slowly down through Scotland down to uh, to London and I would be sitting on the bus with my big portfolio jammed on my arm and some guys sleeping on my shoulder going when I grow when I become a rich famous comic artist I'm <laughs> never going to go on a bus ever bloody again <laughs> and uh, uh, so yeah it was tricky you know you could send samples off but it was so far away, you know, and going to a comic convention, there was there was one comic convention in the UK then, it was UCAC, so I would go to UCAC. Uh, I think I went, my first UCAC was UK Comic Art Convention, run by Frank Plywright um, and Hassan Yusuf. And uh, God, I can't remember the date, my first, yeah, but, but I think Alan Moore was there, Watchmen had just come out, oh. Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons, Bill Sinkovich, no, Barry Windsor Smith was there and all these and I was there with my portfolio and I remember queuing up at sort of five in the morning. I was third in the queue and I had my folder under my arm and the people in front of me, I started chatting to them and they looked at my folder and they said, you should be drawing comics already. Um, I mean, they were wrong. I mean, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't really ready, but it wasn't bad, but it wasn't really ready. But, so. There were distances and everything was, you know, if you sent samples to America, it's not like now where you can electronically send stuff and it's there. Um, so it was, it was awkward and it slowed me down, I presume. I mean, if, uh, when I did manage to start going into the offices, it made it much more, you know, even though I was still having to travel over from Belfast, when I did start going into the offices, that did help because you had that fear you know it was it, it, that is a big advantage and it's always been a big advantage for anybody who lived in New York and wanted to break into comics you would just go to the Marvel or DC offices and hang around and bother people until they gave you got annoyed with you and gave you some work and told you to bugger off and leave them alone so you know I mean that's what I did but over a slower period of time it was just because of the distances and the financial aspect of 
having to take the lawn, you know, I was, I was working in a builder's yard and doing, and doing art jobs for people and things like that and earning very little. So, you know, I, I couldn't exactly go over to London all the time. It, yeah. And I had to choose, I had to be very careful and make sure I'd got booked all my appointments so that I didn't miss anybody or anything when I went over. So, yeah, I think it was tricky and, and maybe I might have broken in a bit more quickly if I'd been on the mainland. Um, I, I mean, and I don't think it particularly gave me any advantages in my outlook or drawing style, I suppose, maybe. I, I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it was tricky. You know, knowing Will helped a wee bit as well. Yeah. You know, after I got to know Will, um, that helped a little bit. But you know, there's only so much a freelancer can do for a, an up and coming. You can suggest person and things like that, but you can't really, you know, insist that an editor takes them on or anything like that. So yeah. you know. And then um, your first actual work was I'd be correct in saying Troubled Souls with Garth Dennis. Well, that was my first big work, you know, yeah. that was my first major, you know, 96 pages of full color work. I mean, like I said, I'd drawn Action Force, a couple of G.I. Joe stories. And before that, and a future shock before that, and before that, I did a thing called On Earth As It Is for this free periodical paper called Blam, which was run by the same guys who did Heartbreak Hotel, which was a sort of fanzine which you probably won't remember at all or even know existed but Blam, Blam was a free paper that, that was meant to subsist and Duncan Fergredo was in it that was his first work and myself and a few others that I can't quite recall off the top of my head and I did it that job as well um, but yeah Troubled Souls was my first big thing and that was with yeah Garth and like I said on the back of us pitching it after Garth was coming into the shop for a while. And yeah. how did that come about? Did he say to you, um, here, do you want to pitch a comic with me? Or Yeah, he knew that I was, of course, drawing comics and he wanted to break into comics. And he there was a comic being published called Crisis at the time, which was the sister comic to 2000 AD. And it was comics had grown up. They were political and they were right on and they yeah. tackled tackled uh, issues and all this sort of business. And it had Third World War and the New Statesman in it. Um, and the crisis had started out selling really well, but the sales had declined quite rapidly. And uh, Fleetway had said that they needed some new blood, new stories and new ideas. And they'd sort of put out a call. I'm not 100% sure how the call went out, maybe through Speakeasy or whatever, one of the, because there was no internet back then. Um, Christ, I'm old. And, uh, Carrier and, pigeon, I assume. You just pardon? Messaged, did you just um, like send emails to Carrier pigeon? You just like put yes, your drums right. on it. Was, uh, we usually lit a fire and you made smoke signals. That was the way. Yeah, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. No, yeah, there were plenty of bonfires in Belfast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd imagine, I'd imagine. <laughs> so you could quickly just turn one into a smoke signal. Anyway, um, so yeah, Garth had basically said. You know, crisis is all about politics and things yeah. like that. If you did a story about the troubles in Northern Ireland, two young lads, as we were back then, from Northern Ireland, doing a story about troubles. And he was right. He sent the pitch in, said that I was interested in drawing it. Next thing we knew, we were flown over by Fleetway to their offices, met with Igor Goldkind and Stevie Mack. And uh, was Michael Bennett that? Fleetway at that time? I don't think so. But anyway, um, I met with them, pitched the idea. They asked me, I think they had a bet on that Garth couldn't actually write it. They thought that the synopsis, the pitch was so good that they couldn't get that lucky and that he would be able to pull it off and write the dialogue and have an actual proper structure and things. Uh, and they were wrong, luckily. Um, and they said to me, can you paint 96 pages of full color artwork? And I looked at them and lied. I just went, yes, yes, I can. <laughs> I had never painted in my life. I had no oh. interest in painting, but the, the big thing in comics at the time was fully painted artwork with Slane and Glenn yes. Fabry doing his amazing work and Bisley doing his amazing work and things. And people and Bill Sinkovich in the States and John J. Muth and all these sort of guys, Kent Williams, doing all this amazing painted artwork. 
Uh, and so everybody wanted painted comics and I had never painted in my life. And if you look at Troubled Souls and you look at the genesis of my artwork through it, you can see how I just didn't have a frippin' clue what I was doing. <laughs> and I was just trying to figure it out as I went along. I was using acrylics, but I was using them like watercolors because I didn't understand how they worked. And then by the time I got maybe towards the end of the book, I'd realized that I could overpaint and do things like this. And that when, when the acrylics dried, I could paint over the top of them. Um, and also I was trying to find my style as well, you know, because I, with fully painted, it's a completely different thing than black and white. And all I'd ever wanted to do was draw black and white American comics. So that's all I'd ever practiced. I'd never bothered with paint. So I had to do that. And then off the back of Troubled Souls, we got through a few troubles more, which was more painted artwork. So that was more painting. And I started to get that. And then we did Chopper, which was more painted artwork. And I did that all painted. Um, and then there was Midden Face McNulty and Midden Face for the, the magazine uh, and Midden Face. At that point, they were expecting me to paint it. And I just went, I can't paint anymore. So <laughs> I, did I did it in black and white. Um, and then after that, uh, I got my first job for the States, which most people think was actually um, the, the demon, but it wasn't. It was a thing called uh, Streets with Jim Hudnall which was a prestige format, fully, fully painted graphic. Oh, <laughs> so you haven't had luck with painting. The next thing, next thing I knew I was painting again. So <laughs> I just, I cried my way through that. Because <laughs> I was so sick of painting. I'm not a natural painter. I'm yeah. not, I can, I can paint quite well now, but I hate it. It's like pulling teeth. I just like to draw black and white artwork really for the most part. And you look so anyway, back. And you look back at Troubled Souls and see how much your art has changed. Oh, like, gosh, yeah. 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 I mean, even, within, even from page one to page eight, there was plenty of change. You know, so it, and for somebody who's been in the business as long as I have, there's no way you can't look back at your old stuff and sort of, I mean, I look at it with an element of nostalgia now, you know, yeah. and, and, and sort of memories of me and, what I was doing in the comics industry then. And of course, you know, not only has my art changed completely, but so has the comics industry. And yeah. so there's that nostalgia for the way it was. And so that's wrapped up and I, can, I look at it and I don't hate it. Uh, and, but that's, and I wonder if that's possibly because of the nostalgia of, yeah. of, of, of a time past that mm -hmm. colors my view and rose tints my artwork a bit. <laughs> But I suppose enough people have said that they like the Troubled Souls that, you know, even now I still get people coming up with a copy of Troubled Souls and get it signed. Or even now I still get people buying original artwork off me from it, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a, you know, 30 whatever years later. So it's, I guess it's resonated with some people and, uh, and, and for some people looking at my color artwork and that doesn't make them throw up. So, you know, that's a good thing. It's a win. <laughs> they don't hey, cry when they see yeah. it, so it could be yeah. worse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I think that is a good starting point for anybody to evaluate your artwork. If if you if the audience isn't vomiting when they look at it, well then you're doing something. Yes, starting to do something right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, coming off um, your work with um, like starting off, you actually also worked on Hitman in Section A. Would I be correct in saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was Garth and I were, uh, the, you know, uh, a, a tight team at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we did Troubled Souls and for a few Troubles more, like I said, and Chopper. And then I did Mid and Face. That was with uh, Alan Grant and Tony Luke. We did, I did Mid and Face with. And then we, we got picked up the way DC used to do. They would hoover up sort of Brit talent um, and pay them better and give them royalties, crazy stuff like that. Um, and so uh, Garth and I went over and we did the demon first. And while we were doing the demon, we the demon annual came out and the, in the annual, that was a big crossover event called Bloodlines, which is universally hated, uh, oh. except for perhaps Hitman. I think- So they don't vomit were, while looking at your art. You know, you yeah, well, you know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so Hitman used to have a, like a red, scarf thing and i think people vomited when they looked at that so we got rid of the red scarf fairly quickly but um 
but yeah, so Hitman appeared in The Demon, and we did a run on The Demon, which I still have a great fondness for. Uh, we got away with so much crazy crap in that book. Uh, but then Hitman spun out of The Demon and got his own series. And I guess that's the thing I'm best known for, is Hitman. It was 60 issues. I drew them all except one issue, uh, though I did do like issue 1 million as well. So I guess that covers for that. Um, we got away with a whole lot of crazy crap in Hitman as well yes. and had a lot of fun. Um, and 60 issues is not an insubstantial amount. I look at that and I go, I will never achieve that again. Uh, there is no way in my career I'm ever going to be able to draw 60 issues yeah. of comic in a row ever again. It's just, I was young. I, I mean, at the time, I wasn't, I was just, I wasn't just drawing Hitman. I was also drawing maybe another book alongside it each time. I would be doing things like Hulk Smash or yeah. um, or or Superboy or whatever the hell I was doing. I can't really recall if I was doing those same concurrently, but I was always doing something else aside from Hitman, which and I I, I guess I I was young and full of full of gung ho or what have you. Plus didn't have kids. So oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so had a lot more time to be able to produce yeah. that. But sixty issues I think is my that's that's my point where I can say, well, I did that, you know, um, I, I can't imagine I'll ever manage to do 60 issues again. So I know. Anyway. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think I do. I think I do. The way you do. I mean, I may look reasonably healthy, but inside I feel like, a, like I'm falling apart. So the idea, <laughs> the idea of 60 issues just fills me with fear. <laughs> that's, that's, what a, I mean, 20 issues, yeah, I could, I could hack that. I can see that because you can, you can split that up and go, well, that's a couple of years, you know, and I can do four issues and then that'll be the end of that arc. And then that's only five more arcs. You know, that's not too bad, but, you know, four more arcs on top of it. Uh, but 60 issues. Jesus. I, I think I'd be dead before I finished. <laughs> back when you were, back when you were young, you could paint 60. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's it. I mean, I, Comics is tough. Drawing yeah. comics is hard. It's a, it's, you know, it's, it, it is physically hard, though actually it, it does take a toll on you if you don't look after yourself. But mentally, it's extremely hard, yeah. especially if you, if you want to can keep improving and, and getting better. So you're always challenging yourself with every page and every panel and every line. And, you know, I find myself more and more sort of, scrapping stuff and starting again and redrawing things back in the old days the first line was always the right line um except for occasionally um yeah. but but nowadays the first line is often nowhere near the right line and it requires a whole lot more lines before i find that right line so and i i think that's possibly because i'm just constantly uh, i've got a higher I don't know what it is. I think possibly it's because there's so much more competition these days. Yeah. The competition is so, so strong. I'm an old guy and comics is a young man's game. And so to compete with all the new amazing talent that's coming along, you've got to up your game constantly yeah. to try and keep up with them. And that's a good thing. You know, yeah. it forces me to stop being complacent and just sort of drawing any old dreck. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's tiring. Yeah. <laughs> it's tiring constantly having to sort of look at your stuff and try to analyze why that doesn't look quite right to you. Or yeah. maybe you can do that better. Or what would be a better angle to shoot that at? Or, you know, maybe the lighting could be a little bit better, could light that better. Or, yeah. You know, storytelling is a bit boring. You know, any of these things. Your work on section eight, I mean, that, that was such a fun comic because it's kind of like superheroes, but kind of like a comedic take. Like we got Bueno married to Lobo, which was one story. Uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was in the uh, yeah, section eight were just basically, you know how much Garth loves superheroes. Yes. Um, so apart from Superman, he doesn't have much time for any of them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, so yeah, I guess section eight was Garth's idea <laughs> of a superhero comic or a superhero group, and they are hilarious. I mean, yeah. obviously, again, even with the Section 8 miniseries that came out not that long ago, 
know, it's probably five years now. Um, it's probably five years ago it came out, but I look at it and what we got away with in that, and I look at the way DC and Marvel are now, and I just knew we couldn't possibly get away yeah. with half of the stuff we got away with yeah. even five years ago or whatever that was. Um, and, you know, that's industries change and people's perceptions change. And, and a lot of that's to do with, you know, the internet and how much people can take offense at even the slightest little thing. And so uh, companies have to tread a little bit more carefully. So they do. So something like Section Eight, I that would not that would not survive now. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, DC are doing their Black Label line, so mm -hmm. who knows? I mean, I might be doing them a disservice, and I might be doing uh, Section Eight a disservice. I mean, certainly, uh, I would. Uh, the the whole idea of getting Dog Welder to appear in the Suicide Squad. Yes, movie. I want to talk to you about that. Yeah, uh, certainly a fun idea. And I mean, we even had your man. James Gunn, but uh, responding to that about Dog Welder and saying why he liked Dog Welder, he also liked dogs, and <laughs> and why, so he didn't really feel that putting Dog Welder into the movie was right. Now, get me, don't get me wrong, James Gunn, but isn't this a movie where tons and tons of people are being slaughtered, killed, <laughs> and murdered, yeah. and yet you're worried about a dog being <laughs> welded to somebody's face? People are weird around animals, aren't they? I know, yeah. weird. You know, they can kill millions of people, but if you show a dog being killed, it's like, oh, so, you know, it's a very odd thing, but eh, who knows? Who knows? All I want is to for Section 8 to get their own TV show or miniseries. That'd be so cool. Be a, and then there'd be a toy line. <laughs> a little mini six pack. Exactly. And little dog welder uh, figures with all the little little dogs that you can then take off as bandolier and and uh and to know that people little kids are running around in the playgrounds pretending to weld dogs to each other's faces you know, amazing that, that would be that would be you know the best thing ever uh, that would be possibly you know then i could just drop dead happily <laughs> Section well, eight, the board game, fun for the whole family. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Can you imagine <laughs> the, you know, the di the the set the six pack diorama with the alleyway. Yeah. With the vomit, with the vomit pool yeah. and all that yeah. Sort of stuff. Yeah, and the broken bottle with blood Great on it. Great for things. children. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Kids love that stuff. Vomit and blood. That's what Kids that's what every five year old needs to chase each other around with broken bottles and well dogs onto each other's faces. See, look, we're... Yeah, well, maybe maybe the parents wouldn't think so, but definitely the kids would love it. Yeah. <laughs> they love it, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> so anyway, yes. Where were we, Daniel? Uh, who knows? A more section eight, I suppose. No, um, yeah, no, but working on that, like, working with Gar Ennis, did it eventually get to a point where, like, you kind of knew who he was as a writer and what he liked to do than, say, other writers? Like you kind of uh, well, I mean, you know, with Garth, with Garth and I, we've known each other for a long time before we got into comics. Um, you know, and so we have pretty similar senses of humor and and taste. Um, I so yes, I, I don't see that it's a big problem. I mean, Garth writes full script, so you know, they, he writes a full script. So as an artist, you know what he wants. Um, Sometimes I add stuff in or whatnot, um, and that generally seems to cheer him up for the most part. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, we're we're close. I mean, I, he knows what I like, and I know what he likes as far as comics go. It's and that's fine, and we work well together. I mean, Garth now generally tends to draw write war comics, pretty much, uh, and I. I have drawn so many war comics now due to working with Garth, you know, even in Hitman, there were war stories all the time and whatever. And I, I, I'm not a big war nut the way Garth is, you know, and drawing, drawing stuff like war stuff and making it accurate is, is a huge yeah. pain in the ass for an artist. <laughs> and so, so somebody who's a war nut like uh, Keith Burns, the guy who teamed up with me on the boys and various other things yeah. to work with God, he's a, he's a huge war nut, so he would handle all the worry sort of stuff. 
with Garth and I would do the rest. And um, so uh, I, I, I'm much happier doing more noir, thrillery sort of stuff. Yeah. Like the, the book I'm doing at the moment, Dead Eyes, that's more my sort of ballpark area. So at, at the moment, Garth and I are sort of part of the company. Uh, you know, he's working on his stuff, I'm working on mine, and that's all groovy. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, I I know I, I'm not so wild about uh, war stuff. Yeah. It's I mean, I love Kelly's Heroes and uh, Where Eagles Dare and f flicks like that. But but to draw it is um, is is hard. And like it's your hard. work in um, Hitman Section Eight, the boys, it's kind of gory. I suppose you could say. Like people do get hurt. It's what? It's kind of gory. Like there is kind of a lot of blood and there's some over top. So eventually has it just happened so much that, you know, if someone's head's getting chopped off, you're like, yeah, just another day, you know, just. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, Daniel, I grew up reading 2000 AD and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, reading Flesh and all the, and Shaku and things like that in 2000. And, and before that, reading Hookjaw in action comics and whatnot and Dredger, you know, that I was already ready for drawing people's heads being <laughs> flying off and whatnot. And in fact, a lot of the time DC would censor us. It was very odd what they would do and what they wouldn't, what they would. I think maybe sometimes they just felt they had to censor things just for the heck of censoring occasionally, just to show that they were. I remember one time I drew a picture of the demon. He was punching a guy's head off. And the, guy, the head was spiraling up into the air towards the camera. And there was a trail of vertebrae <laughs> coming up after it. Now, it was kind of cartoony and funny. Yeah. You know, I didn't, the demon was drawn in quite a daft manner. So it didn't look particularly awful. But they, DC erased all the vertebrae. And, and I just sort of looked at it and went, weird. Why did they do that? But then later in Hitman, there's stuff like, like I can't, I don't know if you remember, but there's the, the Bloodlines experiment is being run again. Yeah. There's this guy called Truman who's trying to sort of create these super soldiers out from the Bloodlines things. And he just keeps creating all these sort of bloodthirsty, insane people that tear everybody apart, including themselves. And there's a sequence with them just ripping each other to pieces. And I'm looking at it going, you would censor a couple of vertebrae, but leave that. I, I, I looked at some of the original artwork the other day because I was sort of sorting through my artwork. I've gone, my God, this is, this is, I mean, it was actually really quite disturbing and horrifying. And um, this is in the, the Batman universe. Though, I don't know about DC these days anyway. I mean, I haven't, as far as I can see, DC's all about the sort of dark and horrifying now. It all seems yeah. to be death metal DC and, you know, dark Joker and whatever. And so, I mean, I've never looked, I haven't looked inside any of them, but they, from the outside of the comics, they look like they're quite brutal and, yeah. um, and disturbing. So, you know, I don't know, maybe, do, it, who the hell knows? I don't. And I know you mentioned that you are like, growing up, you're a huge Marvel fan. All you wanted to do is draw for Marvel. So eventually when you got to work for, uh, you know, Trouble Souls, you did that. But, you know, when you got to work for Marvel and you finally got the hold of Marvel comic with your name on it, was that like a bit of a surreal feeling? Like, did you just kind of sit there? And was, well, yeah, was it different to Troubled Crisis? Like in the sense that you had this comic, but then you got to work for Marvel, which is kind of your dream job. So were you just yes, kind of like- Yes, exactly. I mean, I'd worked for, um, I'd worked for 2008 and uh, drawing Dread was a big feather in the cap um, because I'd read a lot of Dread. But since I was, Four, all I'd ever really wanted to do was draw Spider-Man. So when I did get to draw Spider-Man, it was fantastic. I mean, it was slightly tempered by the fact that it was with Garth. And so Garth has his lack of his, well, not lack of, his disdain of superheroes. So any Garth written superhero story is going to come with a, a lot of sort of, uh, what's the word? Look for a polite word. The word. Yeah, 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 disdain for the yeah. characters. So, so uh, while I was doing spy drawing Spider Man, it was great because I got to draw Spider Man. But at the same time, it wasn't quite actual Spider Man. It was always Spider Man, but 
Garth's version of Spider-Man. Um, so I, I, and I don't think I ever got to draw any of the, well, I've drawn the X-Men a wee bit and Wolverine. With, yeah, I have uh, your actually Wolverine shot here. Yeah, but again, again, you know, that was really nice to draw Wolverine, but in it, but in it, he doesn't wear a costume. Yeah. He never pops his clothes. And in fact, he sits in a car chatting. Yeah. Like, it's a good story, but it's not a visually interesting story for a writer, for an artist particularly. And you know, if I'm going to draw Wolverine, I want to draw Wolverine. You know, clothes, you know, the costume. So from those points of view, drawing, doing things like Wolverine and Spider-Man, and then the Punisher, that Punisher arc I did with Spider-Man and Daredevil and Wolverine in it, they, and the Hulk, they were all in it. But again, it was Garth writing it. So yeah. Spider-Man was an idiot in it, and he's not an idiot. He's an actually really intelligent guy. And, and so, Yondu, you worked on Yondu. What was yeah. that like? Getting to work in Yondu. Oh, that was great fun. Yeah, I mean, Yondu was terrific. Uh, it was the seedy underbelly of the Marvel Universe, so uh, that was good fun. Uh, it was basically 2000 AD meets Marvel. Yeah. So, yeah, Yondu's an interesting character. I got to draw the original Yondu that I knew from when I was a kid, the, guard, the original Guardians of the Galaxy, the one with the big fin, yeah. the big tall fin and the bow. So I got to draw him, which was nice as well um and the silver surfer showed up in it which is awesome because i love the surfer he's such a great character and uh, so i get to draw a few pages of the silver surfer as well which is a real big feather in my cap and galactus showed up for a panel got to draw galactus you know ticked a few bo more boxes there fanboy kid boxes uh, <laughs> as far as as far as characters that i wanted to do so yeah yeah but i i think at this point I'm sort of happy doing my creator own stuff and, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, I'm working away on my book with Jerry Duggan, Dead Eyes, and that keeps me happy as far as sort of the, the, the work I, the work I, I'm doing these days. And whenever, do you have a favorite character that you like to draw? Like out of all the comics you've ever done, like whenever you just get a panel and it's this character, you're like, oh, I love drawing this character. Like, is yeah, there a I, there's, there's a whole ton of them, quite frankly. Daniel, there's a, and they're all Marvel characters, of course, uh, pretty much. And, and it's generally all the Marvel sort of, apart from Spider-Man, who I've always loved since I was four, and I read the Ditko Spideys and just fell in love with Spidey and the whole, and Peter Parker and the whole idea of that, of the Spider-Man mythos. But the, uh, it's generally the sort of B-list or C-list or even Z-list Marvel characters that I have a real affinity for. Though some of them aren't C-list or anymore, like Iron Fist and, you know, and uh, the Legion of Monsters. I, lo I love the Legion of Monsters from Marvel, you know, the Morbius and Werewolf by Night and Frankenstein's Monster and all those guys. Um, and guys like Torpedo and 3D Man you know all these really sort of crap c-list marvel characters and i love them because i loved them when i was a kid uh i mean moon knight i have a great i love moon knight but of course moon knight's now become yeah like super popular because he's got a tv show coming so moon knight's yeah. now super popular again um you know yeah all the yeah any sort of marvel i i love all marvel up till about up till about 83 or 84 where i sort of started to lose interest in marvel when guys like characters like gambit and oh yeah and uh deadpool i guess and domino and things like that which i had no interest in at all started showing up i um even though i've drawn deadpool and actually quite like deadpool now um i just when i was when i was reading comics uh, when when those characters and that sort of that time start to happen, you know, with the, the Rob Liefeld influence on the art style, I just stopped reading Marvel comics. It wasn't my look. I didn't like that sort of style of art. So, I, and I didn't like that way of storytelling with everything being big splash pages and then, you know, and, and it didn't make sense to me. So I sort of quit reading Marvel comics around that time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's not across the board. Anything that Barry Windsor Smith drew, I would always pick it up because the guy was a genius. So I think he was still drawing Marvel comics up until 
yeah, he would do occasional books here and there. <laughs> Arthur Adams, huge yeah. fan of his, um, and I would pick up anything he did. But yeah, for the most part, but yeah, all these B and C list characters, love them. Yeah, that must have been so cool working for them. And you actually also worked on The Boys, which is something that's recently been adapted to TV. So is it weird to kind of look at a TV show and then you, you can say you've worked on the comic? Uh, oh, sure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I've watched the first series. I've, I've only managed to watch like half an episode of the second series so far. Uh, but I watched the first series and they name checked me. And yes. Um, so that was nice. Um, Senator McRae. Our very That's own. Me. Absolutely, yeah. yes, absolutely. Just taking bribes and you know being a being a general bastard. Yeah, that's that's what I'd do if I became a senator. You're written um, by Gar Ennis, so you're probably dead by now. Let's be honest. You probably uh, got. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I probably died a horrible uh, death. That's Gar Ennis. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. With <laughs> one of my feet sticking out of my eyeball. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, the boys was good fun to draw, um, and it's a great comic, um, and the TV shows just as good, yeah. uh, if not almost better in a way. Yeah, you're uh, gonna help Garrett is in watching this. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I mean, it's there's there's all sorts of different factors. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, the, but I, I love the comic, but the the TV show is excellent too. Um, and they've changed it a bit, yeah. but it, it all works. What they, the way they've changed it, it's 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 uh, yeah, it's great, and it is weird to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See you, you know, they see characters that you've drawn up there, and yeah, oh, I mean, I've drawn Spider Man, and then you go to the cinema yeah. and see Spider Man. But that's kind of different, I suppose. Maybe. Ideally, I next know. is section yeah. eight. We get our own section eight mini toys, toys, you know, TV series. We t-shirts brand deal well you know we'll see about that we'll see about <laughs> that I, I, i'm not 100 percent sure um i i think let's maybe hope that they do a hitman tv show yeah. I, I can't understand why that hasn't happened yet to to be honest with you i mean it seems like a no-brainer uh to do a, a, a hitman show uh you know netflix or hbo or whatever and uh just get that out there, and, but and, you know, I I am not the powers of be yeah. in Hollywood, and of course things are weird at the moment. So getting anything off the ground, but Hitman's been about for a long time. And comic, the fact that um, never, yeah, com comic properties seem to be very hot right now. You know, like companies are buying up comics to eventually yeah. adapt the film. So you know, hopefully we get to see a Hitman soon enough. Section Eight and the Boys. Well, you know, I mean, I. I I have no idea if there's any, there's always been sort of vague chatter about it, um, but nothing's ever come of it. So, you know, who the hell knows? You know, it, knowing my luck, it will happen, but I'll, I'll have just dropped dead, you know, just before it happens. You know, I'll, Imagine. Like, I'll, just, I'll just type over and then the next thing, you know, Bleeding Cool will say, yeah, I've hit my TV show coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to <laughs> and um, what advice would you have for someone looking to get into comics? Uh, you've got to love drawing comics and love drawing. Uh, I think the, the, the market is so, so different now yeah. from what it was when I was breaking into comics that all the, all the sort of things that I used to say uh, about breaking into comics are now almost defunct, apart yeah. from being able to draw and drawing a lot. Uh, and studying anatomy and all that sort of business and storytelling. I mean, those things are uh, all part and parcel, but that goes without saying, I suppose. Um, but the actual getting into comics aspect of it is completely different now with uh, the way the way things are. You've got web comics, yeah. on, uh, web comics, you've got Kickstarter, you've got Patreon, you've got all these ways of generating money that you so that you can own your characters and create the comics you exactly want and not have to deal with and you don't have to worry about printing costs and such like and so forth um so yeah i mean i think you just have to be passionate about comics and understand 
what what area you want to be, what yeah. sort of stories you want to tell. And if you want to be a guy who works for Marvel or DC, well then pursue that. And if you want to tell your own stories and do your own comics, well then look at things like Kickstarter and Patreon and be be busy on social media and build up followings, build up a follower in your st- followers followers in your in your work. Um, and don't be an ass on social media. Uh, just, <laughs> yeah. just be be decent and polite. And if you've got some, if you don't like something, don't say it. And if you do like something, do say it. Uh, and I guess that's and just promote your work and and get it out there. Uh, it, it's it's just such a different playing field now. It's so 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 do, so different. Yeah. I mean, now I'm kickstartering stuff, and I never thought I would ever do that. Um, but it's it's a way to do things exactly the way you see them and the way you want to do them. Um, it's hard. Kickstarter is hard. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I knew how hard it was when people had told me. People who had done Kickstarters before, I talked to people, and they said, you know, it's tough. It's almost a full-time job. And sure enough, it is. But, you know, if you know... If you if you're young and you understand these things as I am old and do not, uh, so I uh, if you understand them, then you'll probably be a bit more natural with it than I was with yeah. with having to run a Kickstarter. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think it's you know asking me to, to tell to say to say to people who know know these things better than I do probably. Yeah. Uh, asking me how to break in these days is kind of almost <laughs> I don't know if there's any point to it yeah. uh, you know I, I can look at a portfolio and, and review the artwork and such like and, and I could say you might want to go in that direction or you might want to point your work that way but I think there's just so many options now mm-hmm. and you've got to know where you want to go with your stuff and yeah. how you want to publish. I mean, a lot of people, they just want to tell their story and they don't necessarily have, it doesn't have to make them a living. Um, you know, that's just something that it's a passion project as well. So it's always nice if you make a living, obviously, <laughs> in your artwork. I mean, uh, the whole idea of an artist working because he loves to work or she loves to work. He um, just, and just doing that and, and not making money is kind of ridiculous. Um, you know, we all we all need to live. Yeah. So, and um, tell me a bit about your new um, book, The Mighty World of McRae. Oh, well, again, industry took a bit of a hit initially, as did so many industries. And I find myself sort of looking down the barrel of not much work. So, I decided I had always had this idea about putting out a book of retrospective of my work, um, my creator own stuff. I've done a lot of work over the years, um, and a lot of it was been for Marvel and DC, but also I've done tons of stuff that has been creator own for various companies or uh, that where I've retained the rights to it. Oh, yeah. um, so, so I decided I'd better put this book out, get going with it. So. It's basically my my idea was that if you're I don't know you might not remember but uh, back in the seventies sixties seventies and eighties really were the were the golden years for these things were the the annuals the British uh, annuals that used to come out where you would have comics printed in them but you also had articles and features and puzzle pages and pinups and all this sort of stuff in these books as well they were hardback and reprinting stuff and I wanted to have that sort of feel these annuals that you would get for Christmas um and it would you know I remember getting my Marvel annuals and the Beano and 2080 annuals and things like that and loving them and getting those at Christmas and the idea was to emulate those books so I've put in lots of reprint my old work that I own but I've also put in lots of features and puzzle pages and pinups and, and interviews with people to, uh, and and it's sort of it's a 200 page book that is going to come out annually uh, at Christmas or just before Christmas I, I kickstarter in August or I kickstarted in August 
and then the book was printed in in September, October, and most people have got their book now, but I still have copies if yeah. people want to buy it and it's for sale on that. But it just features a lot of work that I did over the years and it sort of shows different styles and different things I've done. And it, it features work by Garth, uh, Phil Hester, you know, writers, yeah. uh, Ben McCool, Mal Coney, and, and various folks like that as well. And there's some, but there's also some new stories in there. Jerry Duggan has done a new Dead Eyes Pro story that's in there that I illustrated. And then there's also a new uh, story that's to be coming out next year at some point, uh, a new uh, sci-fi story by Jerry and myself. And where can anybody so, yeah, pick that up? Yeah, anybody can pick it up off my website. I mean, it's got limited distribution in some shops, um, which are mentioned on my Facebook and Twitter page. You can see the shops that have it. Um, somewhere, uh, there's only one in the States so far that's picked it up because the postage is so, so, so prohibitive. Postage yeah. to America is so expensive. Um, so it's quite a blow for shops to have to pay that extra money. But there's one shop, um, Third Eye, in the States who have it. And then there's about five uh, shops around the UK that have it too. So, but yeah, but mostly I've sold it. The Kickstarter was quite successful. And uh, I'll be doing it again next year. And for anyone that would like to pick that up, um, you can go to John McCray's website. That'll be top link in the description. And um, just so make sure to click on it and pick it up. And um, it sounds really amazing. Um, but yeah, uh, so working on that, was that like working on that? Did you feel kind of nervous? Because, you know, if a lot of people want to find out about your work and, you know, you're putting it out there and is this kind of like your work in a nutshell, like everything you've done? I suppose, yeah. I mean, I think any time you put anything out as an artist, uh, you know, be it a writer or a musician or an illustrator or whatever, when you put yourself work out into, public, into the public, you're going to be nervous because, yeah. you know, you've poured your heart writing or what have you and then you're going to get judged and these days the judgment can be brutal and instantaneous because of the internet so um so yeah you're always nervous about putting anything new out but any drawing you know you yeah. you it's 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 you know you've poured your heart and soul into it and you you hope people like it and you want them to and of course with a with a book like a kickstarter you're also hoping that people will like your work enough that they'll actually give you money so you're nervous that you're you're actually going to make your your goal on the kickstarter and make the money and i guess it's kind of a what's the word it's kind of a, a, a validation of you as an yeah. artist that maybe you've got enough people out there that like your stuff that they actually support you and, and when you do have that, it's it's a great feeling. And they but, don't throw up when they look at your art, you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. we're not doing bad, are we? Um, no. The wallet throws up, but lovely green money and, <laughs> and um, instead of green wallet. And, and that's that's a beautiful thing. So uh, yeah. it's, 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 yeah, but any any person who puts out work for the general public consumption is going to be nervous because you know, you, you are being judged, your, your work is being judged, it, be it financially, yeah. you know, or, you know, reviewing or what have you, it's, it's, it's judged and you, you always want people to like your stuff. Well, I mean, otherwise, why are you doing it, I suppose? I mean, I, I have enough trouble liking my own stuff that uh, I could really do with some other people liking it instead, you know. I, I mean, know, every, plenty of people love it, plenty of people love it. But yeah, but, but to, to be an artist who improves and continues to improve, yeah. you've got to be quite brutal with yourself. You've got to look at your work and, and, and sort of hate it, really, uh, so that you improve. I mean, every time I draw something, within seconds of it being drawn, I'm looking at it going, <laughs> of, of self-publishing is that you can end up becoming one of those people who never draws anything because you're so busy being critical of your work and redrawing stuff and redrawing like i was saying earlier i'd redraw stuff a lot more these days and it's 
it's that balance between knowing when, when do you stop? When do you look at your work and go, okay, I just have to accept that this is good enough and yeah. move on to the next thing and make that a bit better, hopefully. Um, mm. And that's the real <laughs> problem of that. Well, one of the problems of being an artist of any sort or, you know, any creative of any sort is that you're constantly battling yeah with the, the the fact that you have to make a living and that you have to just get it out there and just accept that it's good enough at the moment and that'll and, you know the next one will be better yeah so you know, like, you're always striving for that yeah you're your own Sorry. biggest critic yeah yeah oh god yeah you're always striving to be perfect and and always falling short yeah you know that's the thing and one of the things that fills me with uh, the most pleasure is the wrong word, happiness, I suppose, is when I see other artists that I think are absolutely fantastic being self-loathing and self-critical of their own work. I mean, I'm not happy because they're in despair, yeah. but I'm happy because I can see that they see flaws in work that I look at and go, this is fantastic. And they mm -hmm. see the flaws in it. And I sort of go, right, okay. So that means that maybe when people look at my work, they like it and don't see the flaws. And so hopefully, and, uh, and it's just me and my, and being super self-critical because I'm so close to it. But, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. When, when I see other artists like, you know, Eric Canetti sort of beating himself up online because, you know, he, he, he doesn't draw well enough, rolls eyes, the man's <laughs> genius. Um, then, then that makes me feel slightly less uh, paranoid about my own work. Yeah. So are, we, are, are, are you ever like happy when you're after like doing art and you think, yeah, this is this is good, or are you constantly trying to make it better? You know, fix the shade and fix the lighting, or. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, there's been occasions where I've gone, oh yeah, that's quite good. It never really lasts. <laughs> it, maybe. I mean, you know, it never really lasts. Yeah. I, I never put my own artwork up on the wall uh, because why would I? That would be insane because I would just sit there looking at it going, Christ, that's terrible. <laughs> and uh, so, so I, 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 I'm, I'm more happy about the fact that people like my work. Yeah. You know, that pleases me. I'm always, it's always nice to think that there's somebody who's enjoying my work. And that fills me with happiness to, to know that is that way. Uh, I struggle with enjoying my own work, let's yeah. put it that way. Uh, and I can always see how I should have done it better uh, fairly quickly. Um, strangely, though, conversely, I'll look back. Well, that's, it's not entirely true, but I'll look back at really old stuff. They're not trouble cells. But yeah. even some of Trouble Souls is all right. And I was talking about that earlier and whether or not it's the rose tinted spectacles at the time that made it better. But I, I read The Demon again recently and I really enjoyed it. And I and I thought and I looked at the energy that was in the artwork and thought, God, I really just drew it. It was like balls out <laughs> Whoa! when I was drawing it. Uh, it, it. It certainly looked that way. It came yeah. out came that way through in the artwork. And I, I sort of go, went, have I lost that? Can I, do I draw like that? I can't, I don't think I can draw like that anymore. I've lost that. Whoa. I mean, it's, I think I'm better as an artist. Yeah. You know, my work is more financed, I guess. But I think maybe I've lost some of the sort of like, Rah! but you know, maybe that's just getting old anyway. You, kind yeah. of, you, you get less dumb and more smart. Yeah. Maybe you get less physical and more sort of seeing the ways around the problems. Um, uh, so yeah, it's interesting. You know, yeah. everything changes and moves and evolves. Um, and so things that you used to do, maybe you don't do anymore, uh, but you hope that you're doing things better. And, and uh, yeah, I is there any upcoming great. projects you'd like to talk about? Or anything upcoming? Uh, well, I mean, I'm working on uh, volume two of Mighty World of McRae. Yeah. Um, 
and, and Dead Eyes is ongoing. Unfortunately, due to circumstances, uh, the the second volume will be sometime next year. Yeah. Um, there is a Dead Eyes related thing that will be happening early next year, uh, which Scaring I can't talk about just yeah. yet. Yeah. Pardon? A scaring but, hood, and, what I believe. You've, no, 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 no. Scarlet Hood's uh, Mick yeah, Roach's. Yeah, but you, you have a cover. Mick Roach's. Yeah, I did a cover, but yeah, that's yeah. nothing to do with uh, Dead Eyes. Um, uh, Dead Eyes, well, there'd be something in sort of, uh, I called Nick Roach uh, Mick there, and I apologise, <laughs> Nick, if you're listening. If, uh, but I called you Mick. I don't know why I did that. Anyway, um, yeah, The Scarlet Hood, Scarlet Hood's a great book. Yeah, that's a really good book. Um, and I was really chuffed to get to do a cover on it. Um, but yeah, I've got a Dead Eyes thing that sometime in early next year, just keep an eye on my social yeah. media. And then I have a new project that I'll be starting in January as well, but I cannot talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I imagine it's the Section 8, the board game. It uh, comes with glass bottles as well. Yeah. 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 Not that. Uh, okay, okay. Don't. I'll keep the secret. I'll keep the secret. Anyway, uh, where can people find you if they'd like to check out your work on any socials? Uh, I'm on Twitter, McRayman1. Uh, I'm on Instagram. No, hold on. At McRayman is Twitter. Yeah. I'm so old. <laughs> At McRayman is Twitter. McRayman1 is Instagram. On Facebook, I'm John McRae, I guess. Yeah. Because um, I'm still on that hell site. Uh, and I have a website, www.johnmcrae.co.uk. Yeah, that'll be top uh, link in the description. You can check them out there. Ah, bless you, sir. So, um, yeah, that's that's me on the socials. That's all. Yeah. I can't do any more because it wastes <laughs> enough of my time. But they are a time sink. Yeah, anyway, John, thank you so much for coming on. What a pleasure it's been interviewing you and picking your brain, I suppose. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Everyone. <laughs> yeah, I like that, Daniel. Brain, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That's the way I describe my brain as well, Dan. <laughs> I put it very elegantly. It's a put brain, it very elegantly. I, suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I put it very elegantly, I guess. Yeah. yeah um, you did, you did. Thank you. What a pleasure it's been talking to you. Uh, everyone, please make sure to check out John's work and um, yeah, make sure to pick it up. His website will be top link in the description. And um, but yeah, John, thank you so much for coming on. It's my and as always. Daniel, thank you. Yeah, please make sure to uh, click like and subscribe and please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Children's Society. That'll be bottom link in the description under John Chris. So, um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. And thank you again, John. And yeah, I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye.